thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name's uh, Benji. Uh, I'm a uh, developer. i am been uh, mostly writing Java. I've uh, been writing Java for probably getting on for 15 years now. Uh, I'm Benji Weber on Twitter. Do heckle along um, and uh, send me questions afterwards or thoughts I'd like to hear from you. Um, I am uh, not an expert in what I'm going to be talking about today. I just find it interesting. Um, so I apologize in advance if I use incorrect terms. You can ask Richard afterwards all the things I said that were wrong. Um, I currently work at an ad tech company called Unruly, uh, mostly working on uh, our ad exchange, um, uh, writing uh, software to run auctions for ads very quickly in real time, quite fast. So that's quite interesting. Another thing about me is I really love Java and Java the language, which seems to feel like something that one should apologize for. Uh, Java the JVM seems quite popular nowadays. Um, Java the language is really popular in terms of usage, um, but I don't meet many people who actually really like it. Uh, lots of people are happy using it, tolerate using it, um, but uh, look, most people seem to have complaints about it. Um, and, uh, but I, I really like Java the language, and hopefully some of that enthusiasm will come across today. What I'd like to, the main thing I'd like to get across is going from uh, kind of feature envy of other languages. I wish we had this feature in Java, or wish I could do this in Java, because then I'd be able to write the code that I want to write in the style that I want to write to express the uh, um, domain problems I want to make clear through the code, to express my intent through the code. Um, it's really easy to look at other languages and think, uh, if we could do things that way, my code would be so much better. Um, and I'm going to suggest, can we instead say, uh, I want to write the code in that style in Java using the tools we have available. Uh, how could we do that? I'm going to show you quite a lot of uh, code examples. Um, don't worry if you don't fully understand how they work. Hopefully you'll get a flavor for the kind of things that are possible that I'm talking about. Um, they're also probably not code examples that you'd want to put in your code base. Um, I'm, before you burn me at the stake, I'm not suggesting you go away and rewrite all of your code to look like this. Um, I've picked some examples that are deliberately uh, unusual to demonstrate that things may be possible that you might not have considered before. So Java 8. Java 8 is perhaps quite old news now. You've probably been to other talks about it. Um, it's been out for what, over a year. My team actually started using it in production several weeks before it was released. Uh, so we've been using it for a year and a half now, I think, in production. So it seems like quite old news to us. Um, how many people are using Java 8 in production? About a third? OK, cool. But that's a lot better than it has been. Um, uh, the reason I want to talk about it now is I think this is a really exciting time. Uh, Java 7 being end of life, Java 8 has been out for a year, long enough that it's uh, finally um, possible to start using, assuming Java 8, new like libraries we build, new systems we build, we may as well be assuming Java 8, built and thinking about how we can do things differently given all the new cool stuff we have in Java 8. Most uh, Java 8 talks I've been to have been about, yes, the new language features um, and how they help us do the things that we're commonly doing more easily, often looking at the Streams API, completable features, optionals, um, and other new things we have, combined with new language features like lambdas and uh, method references. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about what I personally find really exciting about Java 8. We're very used to waiting long times between Java releases. Um, the, uh, we see exciting things going on in the programming community at, at, as a whole. And we think, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do these sort of things in Java? Um, and then we wait ages to, to get them. Uh, Java 8 even took so long to be released that Duke Nukem Forever got released first. Uh, <laughs> Not only that, but uh, we, we don't know whether the features that we want are even going to make it into the language. Obviously, 
the cost benefits has to be weighed up of every feature that gets added. Um, many just aren't worth adding, and even when they are, resources are going to be limited, right? So we, we wait a long time. We don't know whether we're going to get what we want. So this is the reason I'm really excited about Java 8, because to some extent, I think these days are over. We don't need to wait for a lot of the things we had to wait for before for new releases of the language. Now, to uh, for a much greater extent, it's up to us, because many things that traditionally had to be new language features can now be implemented as library features in libraries. Um, which means that a much wider community can work on them. It means that um, they can have different release cycles. It means we can pick and choose different um, uh, d different ones we want to include in our code base, rather than just going off uh, what the language designers decided for us. So that's what I found really exciting. The other exciting thing is that uh, we can do a lot of these things with pure Java. So if we understand the language itself, we can then go and understand how these things work. Uh, we can uh, use our ID, step into the definition of the uh, things, read through them, um, educate ourselves how they work. We can even step through them in a debugger if they're written with plain old Java. I think the Java ecosystem has been somewhat blighted by um, lots of what I call magical frameworks, things that do uh, bytecode manipulation, uh, that do uh, code generation, that do uh, even like ref using reflection at runtime to do lots of things that you can't understand underneath without knowing entirely how that's implemented. Um, and I think that's, that's why Java 8 is so exciting to me, that a lot of these things can be done in pure Java. Um, it's much easier to understand what's going on. Excuse me. So uh, just a quick show of hands, um, so I know how confused you're going to be. How many people have uh, written code that uses Lambda expressions? OK, that's great. Almost everybody. I was uh, <laughs> worried that I was going to have to explain all how Lambdas work, so if we can skip through all of that. Um, but suffice to say, the, the most important thing about Lambdas, from what I'm about to talk about, um, is that uh, we can treat code as data, things that we can have like, blocks of code, methods, and we can assign them to variables, and we can pass them around in our, uh, to method parameters. So to explain how um, things that might be language features can be library features, a bit much easier with an example. So really simple example, if block, um, you all know what they are. Uh, we, it's a language built in we rely on every day. So if some condition is true, execute some code. But if we didn't know this was a language built in, but we're aware of some other syntax, what does it kind of look like? Well, to my brain, maybe my brain is just twisted, uh, it looks a bit like this. Um, it almost looks like a method uh, invocation. So we've got uh, if, which is a bit like a method name. We've got our parentheses, a bit like passing our argument list. We've got a uh, parameter, a Boolean uh, expression. Then we've got some block of code, which is where the analogy falls down, really. But um, now we have Lambda expressions. We can have our block of code, and we can treat that as data. Um, we could pass it to a method. So we could, in fact, uh, take our if that's language built in, move that into a library. We can't call it if, because if is a reserved word. But we could uh, call it, uh, so I've called it when, which basically means the same. Um, uh, so we've got a method called when, and it takes, as our arguments, takes the same Boolean expression, which could be true or false. And then that block of code, we've moved um, into the parameter list as the uh, second argument to it. We can pass exactly the same code in. And then the conditional logic could be implemented inside this method. Now, why, of course, why, why on earth would you want to do this? Uh, well, you, you probably wouldn't, because this feature already exists. Um, but uh, what if you wanted to change how it worked? Uh, one of the most common complaints about uh, things like uh, if blocks, try blocks, um, case statements, and so on, is that they, behave at, they don't behave as expressions. We can't return a value from them and assign that to a variable. 
Uh, so what if you wanted to make if work like that? Obviously, in Java, we do actually have the ternary operator, which does behave like that. But if we wanted to make that when method we just implemented behave like that, we could do that because it's just a normal method like any other. We could do something like this. We could say when, there's our condition, pass the same block of code in. Now we have it return a value. And then the when method could return a value that we could assign to a variable. So it still looks pretty much the same as the original if, um, but we're now able to assign the result to a variable. Uh, obviously, that condition might not be true, so we need a way of specifying a default value as well. So we've been able to change the behavior since it's no longer a language built in. Implementation-wise, that would be fairly straightforward, particularly as this feature already exists um, in the form of the ternary operator. Uh, we'd just have a method called when, a static method, so we could statically import it. Uh, that takes, as we said, two parameters, the Boolean condition. And then, in this case, it's a supplier of a value, which is a functional interface in Java. It's equivalent to that uh, lambda expression that we had there. And then we return, if the condition is true, an optional of that value. And if it's false, we return an empty optional. So the generic method works on any type. Because we're returning an optional, that gives us out all else. So very simple implementation. But we've moved something that's normally a language built in into a library. <clears throat> so to further illustrate how powerful this could be, uh, back when we, uh, when Java 7 was being developed, there was a thing called Project Coin, which added a number of nice small features to the language. Things like underscores in number literals, I think, came out of that. Um, but the most well-known, uh, probably, is try with resources, uh, which previously, if we had some resource that needed cleanup after we used it, you would have to... Um, have a try finally block, you would say try, use your resource, something like a database connection or buffered reader in this case. Use it and then in your finally block you would manually clean it up um, and re re release any resources that it was using. Java 7 gave us this try with resources where we could say um, try, um, get access to our resource that needs cleaning up and then we can use it within our braces safe in the knowledge that when the block completes, it's going to get cleaned up for us. So that was nice. But what if it had lambdas at the time? I think this would have been pretty much a pointless language feature because um, we could just do it ourselves. In uh, C-sharp world, uh, they call try with resources using. It behaves almost exactly the same. But uh, with lambdas, we could, we could do the same thing. So I've created a method called using, again, because try is a reserved word. So we say using our resource that we, reused, that we had here in our try with resources statement. Um, and then, so that's the first parameter to our method. And then the second parameter is, again, a lambda expression, this time one that makes use of one of these resources. And then within our block of code again, we can make use of that uh, resource, safe in the knowledge that this method will do the cleanup work for us and close it at the end. Again, implementation quite straightforward. Uh, I know the cleanup's not quite correct, but uh, it's just an example. So we have a using method. It's a static method again. We can import it. Um, it's a generic method again. This time it operates on any type that is auto-closable. That means it provides a close method that would re release resources. It takes one of those as its first argument, and as the second argument, it takes a, a consumer or a lambda that can make use of a, one of these values. And then it could be implemented with the plain old try-finally approach that we had prior to Java, 8, prior to Java 7. So try and then we evaluate that lambda expression. And then finally, and we can do our cleanup. So again, something that we had to wait for a new language release to get, we could have done ourselves if we'd had lambdas. And that's why I'm really excited about Java 8, because um, there's no more waiting for this whole category of language features. <clears throat> I'm a uh, massive Star Trek fan, so every talk has to have uh, at least one Star Trek reference. 
Um, this is uh, Scotty. One of the famous things Scotty said was that you can't break the laws of physics. I'm not going to attempt the Scottish accent. Um, but uh, so I think we can often treat the kind of feature set of Java and the Java language spec as the kind of laws of physics of the Java world. If it's not possible according to this, it's not possible. Um, and that, while that's true, uh, I think the same caveats apply, apply in Star Trek. You can't break the laws of physics. It's a funny thing for someone on Star Trek to be saying, because from our point of view, they kind of do break the laws of physics. For example, they travel faster than the speed of light, which uh, we understand to not be possible. But they're not really breaking the laws of physics. What they're doing is, well, they understand the laws really well, and they're able to apply them in ways that we haven't thought of to work around the fundamental restrictions. So they don't actually travel faster than the speed of light. They, uh, what they do is create a shorter route to their destination than light, um, and then travel slower than the speed of light along the shorter path, thus arriving at their destination before light does. Um, so while uh, technically obeying the laws of physics, they've kind of worked around them. I think we can often do that uh, in uh, Java as well. If we, if we know the features really well, we know what's possible with them, then we can start bending the fundamental things that we think are not possible. So Java 8 gives us a whole lot of new um, features that will help us um, work around things we might not think are possible and uh, end up writing the code that we'd like to be able to write. Uh, we've talked about lambdas already. Uh, obviously, we've also got method references, default interface methods, static methods on interfaces. I'm going to be using, showing some examples that make use of all of those later. Um, and then, uh, this is where I'm going to get in trouble with Richard, probably. Um, <laughs> uh, we have uh, structural typing. Um, so Java is mostly what I believe is called nominally typed. Um, where So we have names of types. We know we can't uh, have a variable of type string and a type, assign an expression of type integer to that. Uh, we know that if we have a variable of type iterable and if we want to assign something to it, then that thing needs to implement the iterable interface explicitly. This differs from languages like Go, where um, if we had uh, implemented the methods on an interface, then you implicitly implement that interface. You don't have to say that you implement it. In Java, we have to say we do, mostly. But that's not true for lambdas and uh, uh, the single method interfaces that they, single abstract method interfaces that they are equivalent to. So, um, yeah, this is what I mean. So, uh, we've got two lambdas, two lambdas here. They're ex exactly the same. They have the same structure. It takes a parameter, returns a boolean. It takes a parameter, returns a boolean. Uh, we could assign that to a variable of type function from string to boolean. That's what it is. We could also equally well assign that to a variable that is a predicate of a string. Um, they're structurally equivalent. <clears throat> this, this is really powerful. It means that we could, lambdas be, are really useful um, with our existing code, we don't have to rewrite all of our code to work with them. Uh, for example, the file uh, type in Java IO has a list method, which takes a file filter, an interface we might have implemented beforehand. Um, and since that method only, that interface only has one abstract method, we can implement it with a lambda like this um, because it's structurally equivalent to the file filter interface we were using before. But um, the, this structural equivalence gives us uh, actually a lot of power to write uh, code that's more expressive, that tells us a lot more about what it is doing. So let's say we have another simple lambda. This time it's, it takes two parameters and adds them together, or it adds two numbers. If we want to assign that to a variable, we might call it an adder, because it adds two numbers together. And we could say that is a by function, uh, a function that takes two arguments, a by function that takes two integers and returns an integer. That is the type that it is equivalent to. 
That's also quite long, um, and it doesn't really tell me much about why we're using that in the context of the code that I'm writing. Most of the time, when I'm writing code, it's to solve some business problem. Um, I want the code that I'm writing to kind of tell a story, let the person reading it know uh, why it's doing what it's doing, and um, uh, uh, yeah, what it, it's explain exactly what it is itself. Um, a by function integer, integer, integer only tells me that it's uh, something, some code. I don't really know why. But thanks to structural, the structural equivalence here, we can um, we could call it whatever we liked. Um, so here's an example. Um, again, it's a very generic one because <laughs> most examples are. Um, but I can create an interface called a calculation that has a single method, it's an operation, it takes two numbers, or two integers, returns an integer. Um, maybe I'm building some sort of calculator. And then I can have the, exactly the same lambda we had before and assign it to a variable of type calculation. Um, and maybe that means more in the context of the code that I'm writing. But we, we can use this approach with uh, most of the code that we write. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say that a lot of the time we should avoid using the standard interfaces in Java util function, the your function by function, I don't think we have a try function, um, predicate and so on, and instead try and declare more meaningful types that mean something in our domain. Yeah, quick question. Yep. Uh, could you say interface calculation extends the by function of three integers? Yes, you could do that as well. Yeah, I have some examples that do that um, if you didn't want to specify your operation method. Um, it may depend on what you are trying to convey. Um, there are times, and we'll see this in a few slides, I think, where the name of this method is actually useful to you. Um, but yeah, it, and I, I do ha also have some examples where we can just extend that interface, and then you wouldn't have to declare this method at all. Yeah, both, both approaches are quite useful. Also, you avoid uh, out-of-boxing, uh, not implementing uh, the by function. Mm -hmm. So this is another reason why... Yes, because, because I've used primitives, we've got auto-boxing going on as well. Yep, you're right. Um, but so I'm suggesting if you um, declare your own types, then they'll mean something within your domain. In the same way that uh, we try and avoid just using primitive types or built-in types like string throughout our entire code base um, because that doesn't really tell you much about what it's doing. It doesn't let you use the kind of power that the type system gives you to enforce constraints around your uh, um, application. I'm just going to skip this one in the interest of time. I mentioned that uh, some of these new features are particularly amenable to allowing you to bend the uh, laws of physics or the Java language spec. Um, so this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, who's tried to do something like this before? Quite a few people. Can anyone tell me why it doesn't work? Because of erasure. Because of erasure. Yeah, most people say that. Um, I don't think it's quite correct. Um, uh, but it, it's kind of easy to convince yourself that because if these two methods, if you remove everything in the um, type parameters, then they have the same type signature, right? You can't over, over, uh, overload things with the same type signatures. Um, I don't think it is due to type erasure um, because the workaround wouldn't work that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I think uh, it's just that, well, the Java language spec prohibits it. It says, basically, thou shalt not have two methods that have the same override equivalence, I think, or something along those lines, where override equivalence uh, ignores the stuff, the generic type information. So this is something that's pretty expressly prohibited by the Java language spec. Um, um, but can we use our new tools to work around it in new interesting and exciting ways? Well, yes. That's why you chose it as an example. Uh, like uh, most um, problems in computer science, it could be solved by another layer of indirection. Uh, the problem is it won't let, we can't take as our method parameter arguments 
Um, the, we can't have the generic type information there because then they're override equivalent. So we could move it away. Instead of passing a list of strings or a list of integers, let's pass a reference to a list of strings or a reference to a list of integers. Uh, uh, and then we can just pass our reference to a string of integer type or a reference to a list, string, a list of integers type to our methods. They no longer have the same erasure. Compile is perfectly fine. Um, this is where I used the extends example. Um, so then we need to declare those types. Um, what is a reference to a thing? Uh, well, it's a bit like a supply of a thing, I think. It's something that on demand can be asked to provide me with that thing. So how do we do that? Well, we have a supplier interface in Java already. So I can just declare my reference and say that it extends a supplier of the thing that I'm referring to. Uh, so list string ref is a supplier of list of string. List of integer ref is a supplier of list of integer. Don't need to do anything else, um, as was pointed out earlier, because the single abstract method is on the supplier. We, with this workaround, yeah, unfortunately, you would have to change the call site of this method. We can't just pass in the list of strings and list of integers we did before. Um, we'd have to pass a reference. But we don't need to instantiate anything. We don't need to import the types. Um, all we need to do is wrap the list of strings or list of integers we had we were passing already in a lambda that takes no arguments and returns that. So bracket, bracket, arrow, bracket, bracket, arrow um, for our reference. And then, so this lambda here that returns a list of strings or a list of integers is structurally equivalent to either our list string ref in this case or our list integer ref in this case. Um, and the compiler works out which one we want to call and everything just works. <clears throat> so probably not something that's very sensible to do, uh, but the point is, if you know the features and how they work, then you can use them to work around other things that you'd like to work around, but can't work out how. Uh, it's a bit like bending the laws of physics, I think. Now, uh, what would you say is the number one complaint about Java the language? Someone said checked exceptions. That wasn't what I was thinking of. <laughs> Anyone else heard any other most common complaint about Java the language from people maybe who use other programming languages? Primitive types. Primitive types. Uh, what about primitive types? Uh, they break the, the, the object. They break the object-oriented uh, unity, and they are something that are not an object. Uh, hmm. and, so, and, and for this reason, you have. Uh, the in stream and, and a lot of specialized classes that are for primitive. So primitive types introduce a load of complexity. Yep, that's right. What have I done? Using my new toy for the presentation, that's why, yeah. Um, yeah, OK, that's interesting. So none of the questions I got any of the previous times I did this talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so usually you get two answers. One is Java is slow, which isn't really a problem with Java the language. <laughs> um, and the other one is that Java is verbose. Um, that uh, things you want to do that should be really simple, you have to write loads of code to do them. So that's what I usually hear. Um, obviously not uh, uh, mixing with the same uh, people as you guys. Um, anyway, that, that's what I want to talk about a bit for now. Um, so Java being verbose, there's a lot of debate whether this is actually a problem. Some people argue, well, we have loads of tools that auto-generate our code. It doesn't really matter. Um, people, we're writing code a lot more than we're reading. We're reading code a lot more than we're writing it anyway. So it's more important that reading it is clear, which is true. So is it a problem that we have to write loads of code to do things? So it should be simple? Well, I think it is. Uh, why? This is one of, one of the reasons. Um, it's a thing called primitive obsession, which I touched on earlier, or um, obsession with using uh, built-in types that we have available, like primitives or like um, things like strings as well. Uh, we quite often write code like this, at least. Um, I see it a lot, where you might have an update method. It's taking a volume, and we're using an integer to represent that. Trouble with that. Well, there's lots of problems, but 
some of the most common. I don't know anything about what values could be valid. Can I pass a volume that's a million? <laughs> don't know. What if I want to find all of the places throughout my code base that volume is used because there's some requirement to change them all? Can't do that, really, because it's going to be mixed up with all of the other reasons I use integers in my code base. Um, so it's pretty bad. Um, there's also limited information to tell me what's going on here. It would be much better if we declared a meaningful type. So we could just have volume as a type, right? Uh, pass and uh, accept the value of that type instead of an integer. Then the, if I want to know what values are valid, I can go and look at the definition of volume. If I want to know um, all the places it's used, that's kind of basic IDE feature, right? I can say, find me all the references to this. So why do we persist? Um, I say it all the time. Uh, we just use primitives or readily available types instead of declaring our own that uh, are more meaningful. Well, I think it's because of the verbosity thing. So bearing in mind, all I wanted was a single numerical value. I'm going to declare a volume type. Uh, we've got a field to store that. Uh, we're going to have a constructor. Stick my validation in there. Um, so someone on the team is probably going to say, oh, you should have some getters and setters. So let's add some uh, getters and setters. Uh, um, and what if we want to store it in a collection or just compare it? We better have an equals method. This is all auto-generated by IntelliJ, by the way. Uh, best to a hash code as well, which in this case is really simple because it's just wrapping a primitive. Uh, best do two string while we're at it. Uh, we've got 42 lines of code for just a single value is what we wanted to represent. I've done it again, haven't I? Must be a button on my clicker. Um, so I think this, this is one of the reasons why we don't do it. At this point, someone's gonna, we're going to be having an argument probably about uh, where we should put it in our code base, and uh, someone's going to be arguing about whether we should write tests for it because all these getters and setters are reducing our test coverage. Um, <laughs> Uh, so th this is this is friction, right? It, this friction uh, is what holds us back from using more meaningful type names um, that enforce more constraints about our application and tell us a lot more about the code. I mean, I would argue for starting small, why not just use public fields and things? A lot of people have a pretty irrational hatred of that. Um, I think uh, I mean, there are valid reasons for not uh, liking public fields. Um, Personally, yeah. If it's within your code base, why not just uh, change it when it becomes a problem? That would be my argument. Uh, but there are some other alternatives now with our new features. <clears throat> uh, so, it is actually possible to have t um, these values without using classes at all. So our update method, I'm going to want to pass it a volume of 11. I could represent that just by having an interface volume, no class, um, and that is wrapping a single numerical value. I probably shouldn't call it value, but there we go. Um, we need some way of creating ourselves a volume. And so we normally have a constructor. Um, as uh, Samir pointed out in his talk, uh, what's a constructor is just a static method. Um, so we have a static method, it gives us back a volume, takes in one of those values, um, and then it can return an instance of that type, uh, which, because is a single method interface, uh, it's equivalent to a lambda. And so we can just return a lambda that captures that value. And now we've got a, a, a type, just four lines, including our closing brace, um, uh, that represents this value. Obviously, we haven't implemented all those um, equals hash code, etc. cetera, but um, even the uh, basic class definition is shorter than that. It's also immutable. Um, now, I often find myself using things like this when um, I'm tempted to just use a primitive, and I think, oh, let's put, get a type in early, um, and then it's really easy to promote this kind of thing into like, a full-blown class later. We'll just go and find this definition, change it to a class, or we could extend the interface. Um, so being able to do really lightweight things like this, I think, is quite useful just to, to get yourself in the habit of introducing types early. 
Uh, lots of other things we can do. We could add our validation to the constructor like we had in the other type. Uh, we, could, we could even add behavior to the interfaces because we have default methods on interfaces now. So my volume type, here I've added a method that uh, increases the volume just by returning a volume that's one higher, one louder. Um, so thanks to default methods, we could do that. Uh, we could even add more fields. At this point, it's probably getting a bit silly and we should create a class. Um, but it is possible we could um, uh, return an anonymous in a class instead of a lambda. Now that we have more than one field, it's no longer a single method interface. So you can't, say it's, you can't represent that with a lambda anymore. But you could still return an instance of that paint type um, and capture those values that are passed into your constructor method in exactly the same way. It's still pretty uh, concise compared to the class version. Um, and then equals hash code auto generation I wanted to talk about. So uh, one of the most verbose things from the class example was the implementation of equals and hash code. Uh, in uh, Java, I think it's 10 now, uh, we might be getting uh, value types which make all of this nasty verbosity go away. Um, but in the meantime, it's kind of tempting to auto-generate equals and hash code. There are a number of frameworks that do that. Um, uh, there are some that use reflection. I think there's some that use even more magical things like that. Um, but it is, it's possible to do that kind of thing just with pure Java, I think. So my previous example there, if we just want to extend that with equals hash code and put it in a library and play in old Java, we could actually do that um, if we returned a, if we, if we made use of the library instead of returning the interface directly. So um, here's the example. So I'm going to return, instead of the interface directly, a value. Uh, which is uh, a value of paint. Um, that this is a thing I've defined in a library somewhere. Then I'm going to tell it which fields off my interface I want to be included in equals hash code. Now, thanks to one of the other new tools in our toolbox, we can use method references to refer to uh, properties that are methods quite easily. Um, I kind of like not prefixing getters with get now in Java 8, because it reads much nicer when you have method references. So let's, let's tell our value thing that we want to include these uh, fields in our calculation of equals and hash code. Uh, and we could do that without magic, right? So we could have our value base class. It has a using method. It accepts those, uh, a load of functions. These are equivalent to the method references and just store them, and then our hash code calculation can simply iterate through or stream through those properties and generate us values for them. <coughs> so it's even something as simple as a class. There may be other ways of, of doing that that you might not have considered, which I think is why it's really worth uh, understanding the tools that are available to us. I'm not suggesting you go and rewrite all your classes to be interfaces, uh, but uh, just consider that there may be other possibilities. There's one last example then, given time. Uh, I want to talk about named parameters, which is another uh, feature people envy from other languages. They think it helps them write more clear code. Named parameters would let us write code. It reads better at the call site, I think. So here's an example. I'm creating a person type. and passing it three values to the constructor. Um, you can probably tell all because of the values I've used or guess what they might mean. But I think it would still be clearer if Java supported named parameters, you could do something like this and actually say what each of those values mean. But we don't have that. So in Java, typically, we work around it using builder pattern. Uh, we might do something like this where we create a person, and we use the fact that methods have names to indicate what each of those values mean. So again, why don't we do this? And again, I think it's due to the amount of boilerplate that's needed. So bearing in mind, we already have our person type defined somewhere, which has the three fields and all the associated boilerplate. Uh, this is what IntelliJ created for me. We've got a person builder. We have uh, our three uh, fields. 
And we're going to need a setter for each of them. It has to return itself as well. So four lines per setter. And we have a, a set for all the others. And we need a method to create the object as well. Um, that was about 26 lines and duplicated almost everything information-wise that was in the person type in the first place. And all we wanted to do was be able to name the parameters at the uh, call site so that we understand what's going on. So again, let's apply the new tools that we have. How can we make this do this in a less painful way? Well, um, what we've written here with the builder pattern um, is what we've gone from is a method that takes three parameters, the constructor just being a method, it takes three parameters um, to a chain of methods that just take one parameter and return the next state in the chain. Uh, there's a concept from functional programming known as currying, which um, is kind of what this is, I think. So um, instead of having a method that takes three parameters, we move that to a method that takes one parameter, returns a function that takes one parameter, returns a function that takes one parameter, that returns the end thing that you want. And that's exactly what we've got here, um, except that we want to be able to use meaningful method names um, so that we can name things. And that's where this is where it becomes useful that you, um, we don't just extend the base types in Java util function. So how do we do that in Java 8? Well, we need an interface for each state along the way. Um, so the first thing we want to do is specify the first name, then we want to specify the last name, then we want to specify the height. And each one of those uh, states um, has a method that accepts that value and returns the next state in the chain. So you specify first name, we get back specify last name, and so on. So we've got our three states, because, uh, and we've uh, got meaningful method names here. And then our person method that we're invoking to start the whole thing simply reverse, returns the value that's the first state in the chain. And then we can return a chain of lambdas, and that is structurally equivalent to this chain of states here. So we return a lambda that takes a first name, that returns a lambda that takes a last name, that returns a lambda that takes a height, that returns our fully created and functional person, uh, and just takes those values there and puts them into the constructor of the person. That's still compatible with this code that the standard builder pattern would support. Uh, but even, even when you wrap this lambda onto multiple lines like that, it is still uh, only half as long or less, I think, than the original. What's more, when you have a normal method invocation, if you forget to pass one of the parameters, you'll get a compile time failure, which is nice. Once you start using the builder pattern, you lose those that check for you. It's likely to fail at runtime if you fail to specify a parameter. And this would give you back the original um, advantage of just calling the method directly, in that if you didn't specify a height, you'd be left with something of type specify height and not something of type person, so it would no longer compile. Um, and I think I'm going to skip this now, given time to leave the chance for some questions. So just wrapping up. Um, what I hope I've shown you is that uh, language features, things that have traditionally we've had to wait for new language releases to become, can now be implemented in libraries. We've got a lot more power and flexibility to uh, just write the code that we want rather than waiting for new language releases to come along to allow us to write the code that we want. Uh, we should question the things that we think are impossible even when uh, it's kind of accepted knowledge that you can't do something uh, because there's lots of new tools um, that lots of people don't understand very well that might be useful to work around it, particularly when you only want to work around it in some specific context. And uh, question credit tradition. Just because we've always done something one way doesn't mean that we always should do in the future. There are a uh, whole load of new tools. We can start uh, rethinking the ways that we do things um, in the context of those tools. Thank you very much for listening.
Uh, all of the code examples are just taken from my blog posts recently, so you can go and uh, read those at a more leisurely pace if you're interested. Um, I, did you, anyone put any questions in the thing? No, because the Wi-Fi is not working. Um, anyone got any questions here? No questions at all. Confused everybody. Great. <laughs> Samir has a question. Um, in the old value implementation, you had a pretty nifty implementation of equals a hash code. Is it possible to do two strings in the same way? Uh, with the value implementation, can you do two string in the same way as equals hash code? Yeah, you, there's no reason not to. If you've captured the properties from your value, then you can auto generate the uh, two string. Uh, how do you get the name? If you want to include the names of the methods of the value, the fields in your two string calculation, um, that so you, you wouldn't uh, have it uh, working. Uh, with that implementation, there is a, I do have a massive hack for generating, uh, for getting access to the names of the fields, um, which uh, is, I don't really like because it's not using pure Java, it needs reflection. Um, uh, but basically that involves using proxy classes, so you create a, uh, an instance a fake instance, like a mock of an object of the type you want, then you evaluate your method reference against it, and then you get your mock to record the name of the field, and then you capture that as the, the name that you want to use. Um, but as I said, yeah, even more of a massive hack than everything else I've shown you today. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yep. Yes, yeah, so the name parameter example, you would have to pass, um, you'd have to invoke them in the correct order. Um, yeah, so you can't specify last name before first name. The normal builder does give you that flexibility, and yeah, that's a big, um, that's a big trade-off for this. Uh, that's why this isn't suitable everywhere you'd use a builder pattern. Um, it, it has the advantage you get the compile time checks, but you lose the flexibility to specify them in different orders, to easily add more fields to it without breaking other code and so on. So yeah, uh, different different usages, I would say. Yep. Have we used have I used partially applied functions? Yeah, I skipped over one of the examples. It's too far back to go to now. I did have an example in here about partial application. Um, that's another example where the kind of structural equivalence is useful um, in domain modeling, I found. So often we'd find that the same method is invoked in multiple places in the code base with almost the same parameters passed to it. Um, and that's a great opportunity to partially apply that to specify in advance most of the parameters and then assign that to something with a name so we can create a type for that um, and then pass in the values. Oh, we don't we don't have a try function, but that, that's 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 why it's it's great that, um, that the, uh, we don't rely on having to use the types that are built in. We can just declare our own try function. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh, pretty better wrap up so people can get lunch. But do come and grab me at any time today um, and hassle me on Twitter. Thanks. Thank you.